Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We have a great deal to learn from our First Nations people about uh, connection with both people and country, or they are inseparable, uh, and the process by which Indigenous cultures approach, our Indigenous cultures approach problems, starting from a position of respect, then connect, then reflecting, and and, and finally directing. And I acknowledge uh, Tyson Yonker Porter, who uh, I've interviewed from, and that he's the author of that wonderful book, Sand Talk, for alerting me and educating me to that. Now, today we are exploring uh, a wide range of topics, uh, but uh, returning uh, to the whole importance of circadian rhythm and quantum biology. My guest is Dr. Max Gulhain. He is a training general practitioner and a health optimizing physician. I love that. With a focus on low carbohydrate diet, on carnivore diet, and circadian interventions. Now, Max hosts the Regenerative Health Podcast and is also co-founder of Regenerate, a health summit bringing together ancestral nutrition, circadian health and regenerative farming, all topics that we've explored on our podcast and uh, I share his passion and he is doing a wonderful job with that podcast and that Regenerate movement. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Max Gulhain. Welcome to the show, Max. Oh, hi, Ron. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. And Max, I've been looking forward to this discussion. I've been listening to your own podcasts, which we all have uh, links to, of course, but uh, you've been doing some great work. And uh, we first met a few years ago before the pandemic uh, when I was connected with the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, and you were really into or discovering low carb at the time. But I wondered if you might just share with us before we go into some of these things, low carb, carnivore, a whole range of other things, a bit about your own professional and personal journey up to this point. Yeah, thanks, Ron. And thank you for having me on. Uh, At the time that we met, I was working in emergency department as a junior doctor uh, right at the beginning of of the COVID pandemic. And I was... uh, and. At that point in my career, I was very much interested in in the in the dietary and the lifestyle uh, interventions, and I obviously still am. And um, my, my journey goes a bit further back than that, though, in terms of wh- where I am now and how I'm practicing. And it started for me as a patient. Uh, initially, I had uh, a brush with the medical system through the treatment of acne and. Uh, I was experiencing very, very bad acne and, and went through a succession of treatments uh, after, um, you know, th- there's a basically a ladder of treatments that people get uh, if they fail, you know, topical therapy or topical creams and they get put on, on different pills and antibiotics and they, they go all the way up to the sledgehammer, which is uh, Roaccutane or isotretinoin. And, you know, I, I had a patient journey where throughout this whole process, which spanned, you know, many years, I wasn't offered any useful or any kind of um, implementable, effective lifestyle or dietary advice that perhaps would have saved me a whole, a whole bunch of, of time and, um, and, you know, symptoms and, and the whole side effects of, of, of treatments. So uh, this is occurring uh, at the same time as I was going through medical school, um, learning a lot about, about medicine, but not really being exposed to any, any, uh, dietary paradigm that could have helped me. Eventually, I found uh, Low Carb Down Under, which was a repository of, of um, low-carb metabolic type um, videos by, by a range of doctors and other kind of other health professionals. And simply implementing those that advice or that, uh, that intervention on myself kind of w- was enough to you know, cure me of the, of the problem. And uh, around the same time or just just before I you know finished graduating medical school and before I'd even implemented uh, the low carb particularly I'd even had a brush with the plant-based eating 
And that was an interesting detour and very instructive. And I learned very quickly that for me, uh, an exclusive plant-based diet was only going to make uh, not only my skin worse, but a bunch of other uh, undesirable symptoms and irritable gut type symptoms and um, you know susceptibility to colds, a bunch of a bunch of other things. So I guess uh, it, it, I got spat out at the end of my medical career, uh, my medical training with um, a medical degree and a, a thirst for understanding and, and learning more about how we could prevent disease and how we could treat uh, the symptoms of diseases with, with lifestyle interventions in the same way I'd, I'd help myself. And uh, I learned how, how people could be helped who have diabetes and fatty liver disease. Um, what, what, what proportion of our healthcare and our um, and suffering was simply uh, preventable or reversible with lifestyle. So, so that was where I was um, basically when we met uh, Aron. And since then, I, I've worked at a, a couple of years in, in emergency department, uh, and, and subsequently, I found myself here in Albury, New South Wales, uh, training in doing general practice training with one of our mutual friends, Dr. Rob Sabo, who, as you know, has got um, extensive experience. One of basically Australia's top GP when it comes to uh, lifestyle and dietary reversal of diabetes and metabolic diseases. So I'm, I'm in the progress of, of getting my general practice fellowship. Um, and at the same time, I've been able to implement a lot of what I've learned to, to help people. And, uh, and I'm doing a bit of the podcast on the side to, to I guess, scale the message. Well, I think you'll agree that the podcast is a great learning experience for you, the host, it certainly is for me, and um, and that's why. Well, I, I just love doing it. But it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, Rob Zabo, we did a podcast with him oh a couple of years ago, and and Rob had been in practice for many, well, for fifteen or more years, instructing people about type two diabetes and the medications that were required for managing it until he himself, following all of the advice, got type 2 diabetes and then discovered low-carb living and turned that disease around that was supposedly irreversible in 48 hours. I still remember the story. <clears throat> and, and skin conditions, which I think I've heard someone say that skin 80% of skin conditions originate from the gut, uh, and I think that's probably an under, underestimation, but when was the last time you visited a skin specialist who even talked to you about diet? Yeah, exactly. And, and I would agree with that, Ron. I, I think that the skin is manifesting disease that is originating with gut permeability and with poor gut health. And the, there's plenty of evidence of this because when we remove processed foods and remove grains um, particularly, uh, it doesn't take or, or fast, it doesn't take long for at symptoms of acne, psoriasis, eczema, uh, to rosacea to improve um, quite quite quickly. So there there is a whole there is a dietary treatment of of dermatological conditions, but that is not anything that you're going to hear from um, from your your regular dermatologist. And and you know d dermatologists, you, you know there, there's a bit of a um, you know a, a, every single specialist has a has a bit of a hammer that they use to to hit the nail of the disease which they kind of see the most of. And for dermatologists, it's, it's steroid creams. You know, for psychiatrists, it's, uh, you know, antipsychotics and, and, and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. But, uh, yeah, dermatologists like to prescribe steroids for lots of things. And, um, yeah, it, it, it really is just treating, a, it's band-aiding a, a problem without going deeper into understand you're trying to reverse the underlying cause. And I know we're going to be talking about uh, not just low carb, but the carnivore thing, because plants happen. And it was interesting to hear you say that you were on the plant-based diet and, and it exacerbated things, because I think it's worth reminding our listener that while we do say vegetables are an important part of a diet, basically, <clears throat> they're not always everything they're cracked up to be, because Vegetables can be quite dangerous. They try to protect themselves through oxalates, phytates, salicylates, FODMAPs, lectin. You know, the list goes on and on. And that sometimes for people isn't the best thing either. And you've kind of experienced that, didn't you? Yeah. And, and look, Dr. Anthony Chafee would say that uh, plants are trying to kill you. And uh, I, right. I do, I do agree with him. him. 
Um, uh, uh, my perspective on on plants is a nu- is nuanced. I don't necessarily think they need to be avoided by all the people all the time. I, I really like to classify people into sick and not sick. And when we're sick, whether that means we've got an acute immune um, autoimmune disease or where whether we're you know quite metabolically unwell or there's some other um, you know quite severe medical issue, then um, especially that that reflects a degree of gut permeability or this idea that the the GI tract um, between you know your mouth and your anus is covered with with a, a, a mucus protective mucus barrier, but a, a range of factors in our environment and our lifestyle impair that uh, ability like a, of the mucus layer to protect the underlying gut. So I mean, it's imagine if you had a, a castle wall that had holes in it, and then you know you were shooting cannons, and the cannonballs could just go through the holes. Well, that the, the ability of the mucus barrier to protect you from the inflammation of the gut microbes um, is can be compromised by a range of things that we're eating uh, and and not eating, um, not not only uh, dietary factors, but so things like medications, things like um, uh, plant factors themselves that you mentioned, the lectins and and other forms of plant toxins, but also alcohol, also um, herbicide residues, uh, and also even there's a there's a paper recently that uh, showed that rinseid residue, so so components in detergents that we're putting on our dishes can I- impact uh, gut permeability. So the, basically the consequences of this modern environment that we find ourselves in uh, influence the degree to which our, our guts are permeable. And if that's sufficient to make you sick, then that's it's, it's a consideration to avoid plants uh, until the point where the, this gut lining is has uh, kind of healed up. Uh, and you're you're we're, you're feeling better, and at which point we might be able to reintroduce them, um, depending on on symptoms, and and that's gen- the general uh, approach that that I take. the The other point I really wanted to make uh, is that it's not only the plant ba- uh, the plant origin uh, chemicals, and look, this is an area that I'm really interested to learn more about, um, and I'm very very interested in is. To what degree is herbicide residue um, contributing to gut permeability and to contributing to the symptoms that people are seeing? Because um, w- w- when I talk to farmers, when I talk to agronomists, they will tell you that in 30 years, we've gone from spraying you know, half a 500 mil of glyphosate per unit area of land um, in a season to spraying 2.5 litres of of glyphosate per unit land, you know, three to four times throughout the growing season. And, wow. you know, glyphosate or Roundup is not the only chemical. The, the, the amount of chemical that's being used um, on, on, on pasture prior to being sown, after being sown, um, during the growing season for broadleaf, broadleaf weed control, and then for desiccation in certain cases, which means, i.e., let's kill this thing to help to make a more expedient um, harvesting process. Uh, so, so, and then, and then the grain gets often a grain gets stored in silos, um, and then what happens if there's a weevil problem? So, so the amount of chemical that is actually being used um, in the process of industrial agriculture is enormous, and uh, I'm I'm really strongly suspect, and and at the moment it's a, it's a hunch. There was a there was a look a study a couple of years ago into herbicidal residues in Australia, and there was multiple detected, but. The, the the stated line is that you know they're below biologically significant effects, and you know when you know, when have we heard that before? So I, I really suspect that a lot of the benefit that people get when they go carnivore from a standard Australian diet um, could be the emission of uh, industrial herbicides that is is impacting their gut permeability. And when you go carnivore, you really cut everything out, man made, plant made. Um, so that's why I believe it's such a powerful tool. And um, should should we necessarily need to be on it for the rest of our life? Well, no, no if we can address the other factors. And, and look, I haven't mentioned circadian disruption, but the, the, there is a gut clock. So um, w- with regard to this rhythm that each of us are, um, are regulated by, we have a 24-hour rhythm, the circadian rhythm, that, that controls and orchestrates every bodily process. The master controller is the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, but there are clocks in all of our organs 
that uh, sync up with the hypothalamus to time their, their function based on the time of day or, or night. There is a, There are gut clocks and um, so proper circadian function is uh, is is a, is important or or required for the gut permeability to be essential. So so more and more, I'm really thinking, Ron, that carnivore is becoming facultatively or conditionally essential in some people, not because of the lifestyle that we're we're leading, and that you know if you take away the carnivore intervention, they fall in a heap. But so it's really kind of holding them together. But because of the, all these other interventions that they're doing, they're washing their plates with the commodity dishwashing liquid. They're, you know, sleeping with the Wi-Fi router near them that's impairing their circadian, um, proper circadian function. You know, they're also drinking alcohol. Um, so there's all these um, confounding and um, coexisting factors that is impacting our gut health. Uh, and and the herbicides, obviously, that I just mentioned, so that the carnivore is really uh, holding things together. Um, so that's, I guess, my, my my thought about carnivore. It's it's incredibly powerful. But the question is, why are we so fragile that we need to only be maintained on on a carnivore type approach? Gosh, you've mentioned so much there already, Max. And we're going to come back and and revisit some of those things. But let's come back to carnivore because I mean, we made the point that. Vegetables have natural toxins that they use to protect themselves from predators, and that predators would include humans as well. Um, but as you have so well put put to their man-made toxins, even the rinse aid in our plates, not let alone the herbicides that are used on the, the things that have a significant impact as well. But carnivores, meat, meat is demonised as well, isn't it? And not all meat is the same. How do we, how do you define carnivore diet and what are we actually talking about when we talk about carnivore diet? So my definition of, of carnivore is simply a diet that is of, consists of food of exclusive, exclusively animal origin. So the, the meat mm -hmm. of, of ruminants, of poultry, of pork, uh, of um, fish and seafood, but also eggs uh, and dairy because they are, um, they, they are derived from, from animal products. So I think the term can be used somewhat loosely, but, uh, you know, to me that that's consist, consists of, of a carnival diet. And if we're being really pedantic, you'd, you'd actually exclude dairy from, from that. Um, and there's, you know, there's certain people who have a, a different degree of tolerance for, for dairy within the, the, that within their disease process. And I think depending on what the treatment outcome is and depending on what is going on, what are the symptoms that we're dealing with, whether or not, um, something like dairy is included. But at, at its core, and um, it is, it's, a, it's a diet of just, um, of meat, essentially, uh, as salt and water. Right, right. And while we're on to definitions, um, let's just define what we mean by low carb or what your understanding of low carb is. Yeah, so uh, I think about low carb as, and, and this is, you know, you, you'll hear less than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day um, as, as a low carb and maybe less than 20 is a ketogenic diet. Uh, I think... My definition of, of low carb is, uh, I like to say patients just keep, keep under 25 grams. And the reason why I use that number is because that is when you, you really start to see, you know, therapeutic benefit. And the, the risk of, um, or not the risk of the, the, the chance of using a higher proportion of carbohydrates is that, you know, people simply just don't, don't get as, as good results. And then, um, you know, did they, did they, does the intervention not work for them or do they not use it effectively enough? Um, but again, the, 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 that, that's a therapeutic use of, of low carb. And what, what is typically above, uh, you know, 175 grams is, you know, depending on some people's definition, which is vastly more. Um, and, 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 and that's the problem of interpreting some of the low carb literature, which doesn't show benefit is that, well, they simply used, uh, their low carb definition was 150 grams a day, so so I, I've got a much more strict definition of of low carb, 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's times where it's beneficial to be really strict and depending on the response or depending on what the goal is um, and depending on the season, then we might be able to be less strict with that. Mm. I mean, while we're bandying numbers around, I think it's worth reminding our listener that if you went to see a dietitian or, or a standard, uh, the standard approach would say, well, 300, 400 grams of carbohydrate a day is pretty, okay. that's okay. Three to 400 grams of carbohydrate a day. So when somebody telling you that goes to a low carb, in inverted commas, approach to them, 150, 175 grams of carb would be to the three to 400 gram person, a low carb. But in, in, in a therapeutic sense, 25, if you were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and you're wanting a therapeutic approach, you would say 25 grams would be where you would be at. Yeah, 20, 20 25 grams. And, you know, I think it, it speaks to the, the inversion of, of normality in terms of what we live in in this day and age that 300 or 400 grams of carbohydrates, uh, you know, is a, is a good idea or that's, is that, that's normal. And I don't think, you know, historically year round, um, people were eating that much, that, that many, much of their, their diet derived from grains. I mean, the, you know, the, the domestication of wheat occurred maybe 7,000 at the earliest, 8,000, 7,000 years ago in the fertile crescent. And so th there just simply wasn't the abundance of, you know, a, a readily, um, readily processed uh, source of of glucose in the form of like grains that that we have access to now, and you know in in terms of recommendations for people to eat that year round, I mean the, if we if we go back to the origin of these guide dietary guidelines, uh, and we start looking at um, the work of Belinda, Belinda Fetke particularly, you can see that the the origin of of these type of low meat, low saturated fat, high nut, high grain based diet is 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 religious and it simply reflects religious ideology as uh, insisted and as pushed by the seventh day adventist church from the late 1800s which uh, and essentially um got transmuted or got in, in, imbued into the dietary guidelines in the late 1970s so w w when you say ron that you know people will be told to eat 300 400 grams of carbs they do but the question that i want to know or that i um, invite people to think about is where did that recommendation come from and um, um, it's no wonder to me that so many people are sick today if one of the reasons you know obviously i'm not saying it's the only reason but one of the reasons is we're eating a whole bunch more carbohydrate than we ever did historically mm. no no and and actually if evidence counts for anything and i think it does in healthcare, um, something is seriously wrong because preventable chronic diseases are at epidemic proportion. And I guess while you can't say correlation means causation, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say the correlation between what you eat and your blood sugar levels would be pretty profound. And there's another statistic, you know, when we're talking about three to 400 grams, I think people need to remember that a, a teaspoon of sugar is four grams, four grams. And carbohydrates get broken down into sugars pretty quickly, most. Uh, and um, that's a sobering statistic. Um, the other thing, did you want to add something there? Yeah, go. Yeah, I just want to make the point, um, the point here, Ron, is that there are situations where someone who is metabolically healthy can soak up 300 grams of carbs a day and not suffer any metabolic uh, ill health. And, you know, I was talking to... to to our friend Dr. Jalal Khan about this in my recent podcast with him. And the, the observation is Dr. Paul Saladino, who lives in a, in an equatorial latitude uh, and eats 300 grams of fruit and honey per day, uh, is supremely insulin sensitive, is has got no visceral fat, and, and is thriving. But th there's nuance here, and the nuance is that he isn't consuming any uh, linoleic acid-rich uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, i.e., seed oils, and yes. and he's got a, a he's eating completely seasonally derived fruit, um, which is appropriate for his latitude, um, temperature, and location, 
uh, and he's he's extremely regulated from a circadian point of view. So, uh, and he's sorry. And and the fourth thing is he's he's very physically active um, and obviously sun exposed. So all, all those factors and nuance have to be taken into account when we talk about the effect of carbohydrates on metabolic health. And I'm I'm not suggesting that um not that some people can't tolerate them and be metabolically healthy. That that's not true. You can, but if you're doing everything else wrong, if you're eating Uber Eats and you you're cooking with canola oil and you're staying up till um you know 10 a.m. scroll 10 p.m. scrolling on your iPhone, uh, then you're not going to be able to have handle the glycemic load that um you know Dr. Saladino is in terms of fruit fruit and honey, uh, especially again if it's winter and not and not summer. Mm. Now you and you also mentioned those seed oils as being. Um, you know, a problem, and they certainly are pro-inflammatory, which brings me back to the carnivore uh, diet. And before, you know, we go into too much more detail, not all meats are the same either, are they? I mean, this is why we're both interested in regenerative agriculture. But talk to us about the fact that not all meats are the same. Yeah, the, that's a great, great point. And I think it's both a function of nutrient density and the presence of uh human agricultural derived contaminants so when we raise an animal uh, in a confined feeding operation whether that be chickens or uh, pigs and we feed it a diet that is it would not usually be able to get access uh, to or you know a species inappropriate diet the nutrient content of that meat whether that's chicken breast whether that's pork tenderloin whether those those are eggs is is suboptimal compared to a pasture raised animal. So you feed an, an animal a species in appropriate diet, the human output or the human food is reduced in its nutrient density. And I, 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 the, the one way I illustrate this concept to, to people is that you, you just taste the difference. If you taste a, a regeneratively grazed beef steak uh, or a piece of pork, um, pastured pork, and you compare that to a piece of pork raised in the local well, that you buy from Woolworths has come from a giant confined feeding operation. Um, that it's like a different species of animal. And the flavor that you can get, even without seasoning a piece of regeneratively raised or pastured uh, uh, animal meat is in- incredible. And simply the, that reflects the, the degree of nutrient density um, because your, your brain and your body and your taste sensation is recognizing the fact that that is incredibly fresh and that's incredibly nutrient dense. So that, that, that is the first kind of metric that I think about it is just simply we're not getting the nutrient density of the food in if, we're, if the animal is confined. The second aspect of it is this idea of passage or contamination of the meat with uh, products of industrial uh, human agricultural techniques. And this is very difficult to objectively quantify from a scientific point of view and we're uh, increasingly, I think we're relying on, on anecdotes. But, you know, I'll talk to my friend, farmer Jake Wolke, and his list of anecdotes is, you know, approaching his knee in terms of the number of people that say to him, I used to get vomiting, diarrhea when I ate store-bought pork, but I can eat your pork without any issue. You know, I, was, I used to break out in hives or with rashes um, when I ate commodity uh, feedlot-fed beef, but since I... You, Hey, your beef, I, I can tolerate it fine. And, you know, it, it reminds me of a patient I, I saw in, in the emergency department, and it was the most uh, atopic uh, allergic child that, that I'd ever come across. And, and his mum mom would say that um, the, the, if, if she ate uh, beef from the supermarket and breastfed this baby, the baby would break out in, in a rash. Uh, and so that was the reason she'd gone to fully regenerative beef illustrating and and the, the child the, the infant had had antibiotic allergies allergies so so illustrating the fact that whatever uh, uh, antibiotics or, or chemicals that are being used in the process of raising these animals is being passed on into through the meat through the fat into the human support the food chain and um, you know it, it, it's, it's it's some people more sensitive than others maybe they do have other gut or underlying gut permeability or other issues it's sufficient to cause symptoms in them so um that's a fast they're just fascinating insights and anecdotes but it, it's plausible to me that if we're eating an animal that has been treated with 
drenches or with um, antibiotics um, recently. And, and we don't, as consumers, don't know what the turnaround or holdout times are. We don't know how the the the, the farmer has been um, adherent or non-adherent to withholding periods before putting his animal into the sale yards. And that that that, that, that is contributing to uh, human symptoms. And when we think about the longest time horizon, we didn't evolve eating food with um, antibiotics in it. And confined fed operations, by definition, um, use subtherapeutic antibiotics because that is the only way that they're able to prevent outbreaks of diseases and within their their facilities, which are forcing animals to to uh, live a species in appropriate way. And and that makes me sound a bit like a you know vegan activist, but honestly, we have carnivores have uh, lots in common with vegans because we both disagree with confined fed operations in terms of. The raising the these animals so a long-winded way of answering your question ron but yeah essentially reduce nutrient density and the presence of chemicals that we shouldn't be eating um in, in terms of the 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 confined fed or, or commodity meats i mean regenerative agriculture as you probably know has been a, a passion and interest of mine for a, a long time um, but it's clearly uh, become a, a big interest of yours for all the reasons you've outlined there not all meat is the same, and I know when I see <clears throat> when I see something advertised as a hundred and fifty day grain fed or three hundred day grain fed, which means this animal has been kept in a pen and fed grains to fatten it up for one hundred and fifty or three hundred or whatever number of days, um, I just shy away from. I don't want anything to do with it, and I think this connection between the vegan movement, which I think on many levels uh, are ethically right, you know, mistreated animals. What's good for the animal is good for us and good for the planet. But that doesn't mean stop eating animals because we've had a relationship with them for a long time. You've been particularly interested. I mean, I know you've recently run a workshop down in Albury, which Jalal Khan, who has been a who's a good friend and uh, has been a guest on my podcast before and will be again. Um, you, tell us a bit about the workshop that you ran down in um, in Albury recently, and then we'll talk about this breed of cattle that we were just talking about before we came on. Yeah, no, no, thanks for asking, Ron. It, it was called Regenerate, and it's a health summit uh, and a, that I basically put on with uh, Simon Lewis, who um, from from How to Carnivore, and together we put together an event in Albury, and the, the basically there's three pillars of of the event that are really tying together um, a, a bunch of factors that I believe that are essential that we need to be striving towards if we're going to get collectively everyone's health back on track, and and those are ancestral diets, so particular low carb carnivore animal based diets. Uh, quantum health or circadian biology and regenerative farming. And those are the three pillars of this of this kind of health movement and this health summit that we are going to keep continue to hold um, with to kind of promote and in, uh, enlighten people and educate people about. So we yeah we had about 150 people out at Splitters Creek, um, which is here in Albury. Uh, we had a farm tour at, at Jake Wolke's farm the day before. We had a, a restaurant night, a dinner, welcome dinner that stocked uh, locally grown organic lamb and uh, walky regenerative beef. Uh, and we had a full day of uh, six uh, six sessions, four talks on by, by Dr. Khan, Dr. Anthony Chafee, myself and Jake Walky, and, and a Q&A panel on on the Nguni cow. And it was it was an amazing event and people found a lot of value in in actually meeting each other. And actually making connections in uh, talking and conversing, the the in person aspect of it, I think, was 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 amazing. And it was it was a privilege to meet so many motivated and interesting people. Um, it was yeah, it was it was a resounding success. Yeah, fantastic. And you mentioned the Naguni uh, cattle breed, which I hadn't actually heard of, but I'm really interested for you to tell us a bit more about. Yeah, no, and and not many people do. Uh, for for the listener, the the most or the the most uh, popular cattle breeds in Australia are, are what's known as British cattle breeds. So uh, Angus cattle, which are the Black Angus, um, Hereford cattle, and these are the the most the type of cattle that most farmers are running 
uh, in especially in New South Wales, Victoria, and, and uh, those are the ones that command you know high prices in the in the commodity market. But if we if we think about what constitutes an optimal human diet and what constitutes the healthiest animal meat, then we go back to what I, we were just mentioning, which is um, nutrient density and absence of any kind of contaminants, whether that's antibiotics or, or other kinds of human treatments to the animal, or if it's herbicidal or fungicidal contaminants of the grain that the animal ate. So this is a form of um, food purism that we're striving for. And when when we implement those those criteria, then we get uh, to a situation where we want a ruminant herbivore that has eaten its species appropriate diet. So we can the options are we can hunt. I mean, wild caught venison is incredibly nutrient dense um, and exactly has satisfies those criteria. It hasn't been uh, interfered or, or intervened by by humans. But if we want to get that. Um, if we want to satisfy those same criteria with uh, with cattle, then what we need to do is need to one we need to be regeneratively grazing them so they're constantly moved to fresh pasture that isn't sprayed, uh, and two we we want to use an animal that doesn't necessitate that intervention because what the problem that we have is if we use the wrong animal in the wrong setting then it's simply inhumane not to treat that animal if there's tick-borne illnesses if there's um other forms of of bacterial infection that require treatment so the the, the key point is that we need to be using an animal that has the capability and the physiology to be raised in a way that doesn't necessitate human intervention the Nguni is a uh, African tribal cow. So it was basically brought down maybe around 6,000 years ago from what is now Northern Africa, uh, Ethiopia. And it came down through an, the, the very dense jungle, through a range of incredibly harsh um, climates that include tick-borne, uh, tick-borne, tick-borne illnesses, that include predation by um by African game animals that included even, um, you know, rinderpest, which was a, a massive outbreak in the late uh, 1900s, which affected a lot of um, cows um, and did kill some Nguni, but a lot of Nguni survived. So essentially what, 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 we, what they had is that these, uh, these uh, Zulu people, the Zulu tribes kept their wealth and their, um, their, all their uh, possessions in the front, well, in the form of these cows, and they stewarded them for their ability and their adaptability, their easy birthing, uh, and all those amazing traits. And what what essentially happened is that uh, the the cow then was selected by nature with a very light guidance from humans to be have incredible fertility, to have incredible tick resistance, to to taste great, and to be have a very nice docile and gentle nature so so essentially what you have is what i see is the ultimate um her- ruminant herbivore for human domestication in terms of not only providing at the most optimal food as as those two criteria we mentioned but also as a tool of regenerating the land and as you know ron um regenerative agriculture involves using ruminant herbivores as a tool for improving the, the the quality of the land, the amount of moisture retention, the amount of carbon that's able to be sequestered, and um, they're the tool. And the, the the beneficial, the positive externality of that is high quality um, meat that we can eat. But the the Nguni satisfy these on so many different fronts because they're a smaller framed animal. They um, have they can browse non selectively, so they're eating down a whole whole bunch of um, shrubs that might not otherwise wise be eaten. So to have all these characteristics that um, make them make them perfect for, um, for 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 all these criteria that we're we're seeking, and that that is why I'm I'm so passionate about them because uh, it's it's a way forward as far as I see in a world where I'm telling people to eat meat um, and eat lots of meat. Mm. And that for our listener Naguni N G U N I. Um, is is available where and is that is that coming to Australia? Is it here? Well, where do you find that? So so there is a very small number of purebred and guni animals, and they actually got brought to Australia via embryo um, by uh, a range of South African farmers. They the places that you can buy and guni now, there's not a lot where you can actually get and guni 
um, meat. And essentially, it's uh, one farm up in Queensland called Eastwell Farms has uh, a Nguni cross Brahmin herd. Um, but the meat tastes absolutely amazing. And it's a common rebuttal when I talk to conventional cattle people that, okay, that's all well and good, but, you know, the meat must taste like an old leather boot. Well, well no, it doesn't. It tastes incredible. Um, and if it's aged well and hung, it's, 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 it's up there with the best steak that you'll eat. So it's not yet widely available. Jake Walkey down here in Albury has um, Nguni uh, bulls and he's bringing his Nguni herd um, into development. But uh, at, for the time being, it's, um, it's in progress. Hmm. And for the time being, gr- grass-fed and finished, um, you know, beef, uh, cow, you know, animals is, uh, is still a preferable alternative until Nguni comes onto every plate in Australia. Yes, and, and I do really want to make that point, and thank you, Ron, is that if, you, if there uh, is a, uh, a farmer who is raising fully grass-fed animals that uh, don't require intervention, um, don't require any form of vaccination or drenching, or, uh, and, he, and he's able to do that ethically, then that, that beef is going to taste just as good. Um, I'm not, not necessarily making a claim that, that the Nguni will be superior, all else considered, but um, given the, the the land that we live in, live in the, the dryness and the um, the a, a, the arid nature and the marginal nature of so much of Australia, um, it makes sense that that this animal particularly can be used to to help regenerate that land. But yes, I, I agree with you, Ron. If if you can get access to fully grass fed beef, no matter what breed, that is going to be the best food for you. Yeah, grass fed and finished. So not that they're put in, and not that they're put into a feedlot for the last 30, 60, 150 or whatever number of days, just grass-fed and finished. They have one bad day in their life. Exactly. And, and look, that's a, another great point before we finish this topic is that you, we, we, what we want to do is actually meet the farmer that's growing this food because, you know, there can be grass-fed, grass-finished, but it was in a feedlot and was being fed grass, pellet, pelletized grass. Well, well, that's not what we want. So essentially, the extension of of this approach is to really take the t- t- take it into your own hands and meet the person who is actually growing your food, and you can verify for yourself that the provenance of the meat, the animal welfare that was respected, and the the lack of use of chemical inputs. The, these are all questions that you need to ask your your farmer. Um, and start having some some input and some oversight into what you're putting on your plate for yourself and your family. Because when you outsource that responsibility, then you, you're at the whim of a supply chain that has incentives, economic incentives that are divergent from your health interests. Yes, I remember 15 or 20 years ago going into my local butcher and uh, when I asked about the beef, um, it was it grass-fed or grain-fed, he looked at me like I was, what the hell are you even talking about? I thought he was going to take a knife to me. But interestingly, um, now he advertises on his window, 15 to 20 years later, grass-fed meat. Um, so, so, you know, asking is the beginning of an important conversation. Now, I'm really interested because, you know, you, you've been on a journey uh, through your own health challenge um, and and it's taken you into low carb carnivore regenerative, and uh, you've mentioned it already. But the importance of the circadian clock and our whole relationship with the sun and light and all of that—that's um, that's the evolution that I've been on. I, I used to think that sleep and breathe were absolutely fundamental, but I've now got into this world of quantum biology. Tell us a bit about about that again. I know you've mentioned the suprachiasmatic uh, nuclei and all that, but let's just take a few steps back and give us circadian clock and health 101, why it's important, what it is and why yeah, it's so, important. Yeah, so, so fundamentally, I think about circadian biology as the, uh, the, the fact of res- respecting the fact that for millions of years we've evolved in the, in a very strict uh, rhythm of the day, which involves bright light during the day, which which basically builds in different um, natural light 
uh, fr frequencies throughout the day um, and then changes throughout the, the through that day and then basically disappears. So you've got um, a waxing and waning um, sun, natural radiation from the sun and including visible and non-visible light and then a complete absence of light during the, the night time. So the, the reason why that's important is because we have a roughly 24 hour clock that has evolved to be constantly regulated, uh, basically feeding information from that, that cycle. And the key facets of our biology um, all contain these clock type mechanisms that have their function that are, that is regulated by the time of the day, um, or the, the absence of light, um, that, that the circadian information, the sun basically is offering to us. What, what that means is that for the listener is that we're, we're living in a profoundly different environment to which our ancestors and our uh, ancestral lineage, uh, existed in. And when we, when you take someone out of the environment which they thrived in uh, and we evolved in, then you, you have caused problems. And what the modern uh, electricity grid um, facilitated was immense development of human technological advancement um, and convenience. But the invention of artificial light has essentially disrupted in, in a very, very major way the uh, our bodies our ability to respect our circadian biology our circadian biology needs essentially by exposing ourselves to inadequate light during the day because we're locked in inside um, and excess light or artificial light at, at night and and the, the combination of those those two two things and um, basically place havoc with the, this this finely tuned 24-hour rhythm and you basically get disease, disease, cancer, metabolic disease, neurodegenerative disease, um, in many ways through um, mediated through the effect of on on the mitochondria, which is the tiny organelle within um, many organelles within our cells. So that's that's a high level view of how I think about circadian um, disruption. And the, the the key point is that some people have a a light problem and. Food can't can't solve a, a light problem, and I think that is where, in many cases, carnivore gets people close, but it, it doesn't solve every problem. Mm. It's interesting to hear you say um, we're inside and stuck in light, and we have natural, artificial light. But there's a third part too, which has been the demonization of this thing that's had a pretty significant impact on planetary evolution it's called the sun you know that's been a big part of the problem as well hasn't it, it incredibly and and look it, it really mirrors the demonization of saturated fat and 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 cholesterol and, and animal fat and it it's it's a very it's quite it's a complex um i mean to go into the specifics of it but uh, essentially the the sun has incredible power um to heal and it has incredible um, need from our a biological point of view we need exposure to ultraviolet light we need exposure to uh, infrared and, and all these uva and all these forms of various forms of natural um, solar radiation it's it's not only a, a convenience it's actually a, a physiological and a biological need and when we and when i say we i say um, you know, me medical and scientific establishment uh, institute uh, recommendations that hubristically presuppose that this giant orb that we evolved, that all life on the planet evolved being exposed to. When we, when they say that that is a, a problem and that's harmful and that's um, disease causing, then we we really need to take a step back and be very, very, very careful before we. Um, implement those types of recommendations because it, it, essentially what it's saying, it's presupposing that nature's made a mistake. And Dr. Jack Cruz, who I've done an extensive series with, he, he makes the point that nature never makes mistakes. And and it doesn't, and that's, that's, that's inherently true. It, nature doesn't make a mistake. We as humans simply haven't yet um, understood or fully comprehended the reason why 
uh, so, some things are what, why they are. And to basically demonize ultraviolet light specifically is absurd when you understand the biology of certain um, or the, well, the function. And we can talk about the function of, of UV light, which is not only to make vitamin D, um, but uh, in influencing a very, very, very important um, polypeptide hormone called pro-opio-melanocortin. Uh, which I mentioned Dr. Jalal and I talked about recently. And essentially, uh, and not, not to derail your, your question too much, uh, Ron, but uh, pro-opium melanocortin, and this ties into the low carb and the nutrition aspect, uh, is a master, one of the master regulators of body composition and, um, and energy metabolism. So the, the leptin melanocortin pathway is the, the, is the, the, feedback loop or the mechanism by which the body understands how much energy it has on board and that this hormone leptin that gets made by your fat cells and basically ports back to the hypothalamus and tells the body um how much energy is on board when when you um disrupt the circadian uh rhythm the ability to of the body to understand how much energy on board is disrupted the patient people get leptin resistant and they become um, hyperphagic they become they, they need to eat more the the way that um pro opiomalacortin fits into this is that this uh polypeptide hormone uh gets cleaved up into a bunch of different hormones just like a, a imagine a long ticket and you cut a ticket up in you know eight different places and each ticket got you entry to a different you know theme park that's how, that's one way of thinking about it but um one of the the key things that gets cleaved off this pep polypeptide hormone um, is involved in the suppression of, of appetite. And what stimulates the release of pro-opiomalacortin? It's UV light. So when you, when you understand that, you can see that the key mechanism to regulate appetite and reduce feeding behavior is, is stimulated by, by ultraviolet light. You can see that the sun then is having a profoundly anorexic or um, reducing the need to eat, um, and it does so physiologically because there's energy involved in in exposure to to solar radiation. And through the use of melanin, which is a pigment that makes up in, in everyone's skin, which is again um, uh, secreted by alpha and the signal by alpha MSH, which is cleaved off POMC, we can actually use solar radiation to to drive energy through the the the, the melanin pigment. So when you when you raise that this type of point, um, you, and then you step back and you realize that we've been told to block UVB with uh, sunscreens and wear sunglasses um, and put them on little Johnny whenever Johnny goes to to the playground, uh, it, it becomes absolutely baffling um, and completely um, nonsensical. Um, so that that would be my 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 point, and and to to give you an illustration, Ron, about how ancient this pathway is, uh, the the five hundred million years ago is the origin of this this polypeptide pro opio melanocortin. Um, so these jawless fishes that existed in the you know in a proto planet before the tetrapods even existed, before amphibians diverged, this is how old this this polypeptide hormone is, um, and. Again, it's it was regulated by sunlight. Sunlight is what shaped life um, and and the development of us as as, as humans. Uh, and um, so so to claim that somehow we need to be blocking UV light when you understand the function of or begin to understand it, and not to say that I understand it at all yet, it's that complex. But when you begin to understand the the implications of uh, of a, of a, of pro open amount of cotton, um it, it becomes incredibly um, uh, hubristic and um, harmful to say that we should be uh, avoiding the sun. And the last point I'll make about that, and I haven't uh, just just to ha hammer home the point, is that beta endorphin is an uh, endogenous neuro uh, opioid chemical. It is cleaved off POMC. So nature literally made us to be addicted to the sun because POMC is expressed in the skin, it's expressed in the brain, um, and when you expose the skin and the and the, the body to ultraviolet light, um, you're making an endogenous opioid chemical. So so how can that be um, inherently harmful? 
uh, it's 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 really that gives it context, I think, and it's real um, food for thought. It's so interesting to hear you mention all of those things with leptin and uh, and the endorphins, and you think about the epidemic and the demonization of sunlight, uh, and, and the epidemic in obesity and mental health, uh, and then you factor in poor sleep through our exposure to all these lights within our home, you know, it's a perfect storm. And you think, why on earth would, what, what is the rationale behind public health messages that just keep on getting perpetuated like this? And it doesn't seem to make sense at all until you use two words, and I hate to sound cynical, but uh, those two words are business model. Uh, good health may make sense, but it doesn't make dollars. And that is difficult for patients and practitioners to understand or realise, but our health industry is not about good health. It's about managing chronic disease. And therein lies the rub. You're right, Ron. (laughs) Um, And and I'll make the point. No, no, I'll I'll make the point that pharma knows about the effect of pro permanacortin on on body regulation and body weight, and they do they do that because they've invented medication um, that uh, basically targets the system. So there's there's medication a combination of naltrexone and uh, bupropion that is basically potentiates the effect of POMC in the hypothalamus, a stimulating POMC to make alpha MSH and reduce appetite, uh, and with in combination with a naltrexone which is uh, opioid inhibitor that re- removes a negative feedback loop on on that process. So, um, and in certain patients, this can help them lose weight. So you you can see that it's a known it's a known pathway, uh, and the literature is very well established that UV light and sunlight also is 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 a prime stimulator of of, of POMC. So you can see that um, keeping people out of the sun is is profitable because if you business. avoid the sun. Um, you, 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 people are going to get fat and sick, and and um, th- there's going to be health issues. So, uh, mm. no, I, I, I don't blame you at all for for mm. for the cynical take. I think it's very, um, I think it's correct. And let, let's just put a a very quick disclaimer in here, in that we are not suggesting that people go out and get sunburn. Um, it's not an all or none thing. Um, there are you, you know, it's it's using this resource which is provided free to us every single day um, to its maximum. Um, But let's come back to, uh, because, you know, the sunlight is one thing, but you've mentioned sitting in a room, the lights, the computer. Tell tell us a little bit about our relationship with modern, with light and energy in its modern forms and the impact that can have on us. Yeah, the, the, there's a couple facets to it, but essentially human-derived or man-made light doesn't contain any form of non-visible light, uh, and it doesn't wax and wane with the natural, uh, with the, as the sun naturally does. So you know, in the in the first thing in the morning, you know, there's lots of red uh, red light, there's lots of infrared light, and then there's UV. The UV A A comes in, and then and then closer later in the day, there's UV B. Uh, and then the peak noon, you've got a very high proportion of of blue light, but it's always balanced with red light. Um, and then the basic process mirrors, and throughout the end of the day, it's a mirror image. But when when you're sitting under LED globes, which you know since the late 2010s um, or early 2010s, governments all around the world have mandated, that is a, a profoundly alien spectrum um, to live under. Because it is it has a massive peak uh, of a, a blue a blue emission, uh, and it, it's not balanced by any red light, and it doesn't contain anything um, not non visible. So the way I explain this to patients is just like there is junk food, similarly there is junk light, and any form of human artificial light uh, is is exactly that. It's it's uh, it's junk light, and you know the effect that that has on our biology is that it is has the has the effect of stimulating or simulating uh, a midday signal, and again, if our bodies are expecting absence of of light 
after the sun's gone down, um, from a hormonal point of view, what that is doing to to our ability to to make very important hormone called melatonin that we that we make after dark, uh, it destroys it. it. It turns it off completely. Well, not necessarily completely, but it dr- dr- drastically reduces its its secretion. So uh, that's how I think about um, uh, the the effect of artificial light on on humans. Is that it's it's an alien light, it's junk light, and it's not what your biology evolved under, and it's not what you need to to survive to thrive. Well, I know this is a, a very very big topic, and I did actually listen to your series with uh, Jack Cruz and. You know, I mean, it went on for, I think there was around six or nine hours of it uh, at least. And, uh, and and it is complex, you know, like understanding all the POMC and the different leptin, which helps us metabolise fat and all, all these other hormones is, is quite an important point. And, and you go into it in a lot more detail. If we were just now, people have been sitting listening to us talk about low carb, about meat, about regenerative agriculture, about circadian clock and artificial light. If we were f- going to leave our listener with a couple of uh, basic, uh, easy, can-do tips that we should be incorporating into every day, and I'm sure you tell your patients this regularly, I wondered if you might leave us now with a few, a few tips. Yeah, I, I think most simply, um, mind your food diet. So eat mostly... Uh, uh, high quality animal products um, and seasonal, just seasonally seasonal food, um, with an emphasis on uh, which is naturally going to be low low carb if you're only eating what's growing in that local area. Um, m- mind your light diet and spend as much time that you can uh, regulated by the sun and respecting your circadian biology, which means seeing the sunrise. Seeing, seeing the sunset, going out during the day for breaks without um, sunglasses or sunscreens on, um, and respect your um, your Fitzpatrick skin type. Respect your position in uh, your latitude, the latitude that you're living in compared to your your, your biology. Um, so obviously, you, everyone's got a different amount of um, melanin based on their racial origin. So you have to respect that as well. Um, so res- respect your food diet, respect your light diet, and you know meet your farmer, because if you do those three things, then the byproduct of that approach is that you're going to be eating hyper locally. You're going to have knowledge of exactly what you're eating. You're going to be eating a high quality, nutrient dense, animal um, based diet, and you're going to be um, so re- regulating the the circadian rhythm. Uh, and obviously, part of the second part, the light diet, is blocking artificial light at night. Um, with a pair of blue light blocking glasses or set up your home with red um, which which don't have the same or don't have as intense effect on on your circadian rhythm so i guess uh, food diet light diet and meet your farmer those would be my three takeaway points fantastic max and just so that you know i'm a committed uh, you know i've got my my glasses right here uh, i would have worn them i should have worn them through this interview but uh, listen i wanted to say thank you uh, for joining us today Thank you for all the great work and great podcasts you're doing, and we will definitely be having links to those and your website on our show notes. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Ron. I really, really appreciate it and um, looking forward to having you on my podcast and we'll, we'll have a chat too. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Now, I got first introduced to Max uh, through the low-carb movement, specifically uh, Dr. Rob Zabo, uh, who we've also had on as a guest and uh, many other, we've explored low-carb nutrition many on many other episodes. The carnivore uh, diet is also an interesting one that we've explored every now and again. And when you think about plants, and plants form the uh, basis of so many diets, uh, that or eating plans or nutritional plans, uh, but it's also worth noting that plants are also potentially toxic. I mean, plants protect themselves from predators and we are one of those predators and they have chemicals on in in and on them that are toxic and potentially harmful to humans those include phytate salicylates fodmaps uh, lectins uh, and and the list goes on so plants uh, we do need to be aware of. i've had many patients uh, coming in to my practice over the years telling me they're on a terrific diet uh, 
you know, they're vegetarian and yet they may not be enjoying good health. And while vegetables are an important part of uh, healthy eating, not for everyone, and it is nuanced. Uh, so the carnivore diet really is one that seems to have had some real success, particularly in autoimmune conditions. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was interesting to hear Max's uh, perspective on that and his own personal experience, which is often what motivates many medical practitioners to go beyond the narrative which they learn in, at university and from their journals. Um, so uh, that's interesting. And of course, the whole area of quantum biology and Max has really explored that in his Regenerative Health podcast. And he referenced a series that he did with Dr. Jack Cruz. He did, uh, I think he did three three-hour episodes with Dr. Jack Cruz. And of course, the more re most recent one was with Dr. Jalal Khan, who I've had on the podcast as well. And I will have returning to discuss this issue, which we all need to be engaging with. I used to think that sleep and breathe were foundational pillars, and I think they obviously are, but something even more foundational is how we interact with the sun and the earth and nature in general. And that has a power, that is a powerful uh, tool that we should all be engaging with on a daily basis. Anyway, I will have links to Max's podcast in the show notes. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.